Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Club Grubbery. I'm here with these so-called 60-year-olds, which I think are actually young, younger. There you go. Big, the big grubbery sign right there. John, Graham, welcome to the show. He must be averaging our ages out, Hoodie. <laughs> yeah. I think he is. Yeah, between the two of us, we've got 120 years or so going, haven't we, John? <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 along that vein, I want to put a public notice out there. To everyone that's listening, listening, please uh, look out for yourselves. We are going into uh, uh, magpie season, so just what you know, maybe wear a cap or something. Make sure you're not getting attacked. But um, yeah, gents, welcome to the show. You guys have been busy. You've been interviewing doctors. You've been spreading the word. Um, what's been happening? Well, the, the doctors, the doctors are really coming into their own, uh, Joel, as we're seeing. Uh, this action uh, against uh, APRA by Dr. William Bay and uh, rallies out the front of APRA headquarters all over the country. And uh, some of the testimonies we're getting from doctors in who are members of AMPS, the Australian Medical Professional Society, is breathtaking. And uh, Dr. J. Anthony last night, John, was just incredible, wasn't she? She was, uh, yeah, amazing. Uh uh, a different sort of uh, format to the other two doctors we, we interviewed because she had a, a, a very unique story and a uh, very bubbly personality. So uh, she uh, she would have appealed to a lot of the uh, uh, the folk out there because uh, she she was a real inspiration from, from uh, the point of view of her background. Mm. Well, we've seen um, we've seen a lot of protests outside of the uh, the different. Um it's ASIC, isn't it? Yeah, it's ASIC. Um, outside the different ASIC headquarters around the country, what are you hearing APRA. on the ground? Is it APRA? APRA, yeah. ASIC. I always... Securities and Investment Commission. I always get confused with APRA because they're not only like the medical sort of board that's the watchdog, but they also... It's it's an acronym for another organization. But anyway, um, side note. But yeah, we've been seeing these protests outside the organizations by some doctors getting decertified. Um, and it's I think it's been blowing up quite a bit. Yeah, well, the, the fact is that um, you cannot have science unless you have a, a proper debate. And we have not had a scientific or medical debate in this country, and the country is worse for it, Joel. Yeah. Um, we, we've been censored into oblivion. The, um, the doctors, the medical professionals have all been censored into oblivion. And uh, there needs to be, and John's been calling for this for a while, there needs to be a moratorium to allow doctors to speak out without recrimination. APRA is a malignant tumour in Australia. Mm -hmm. APRA has nothing to do with health. APRA is a scurrilous organisation that represents the absolute worst of governments in this country. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, um, I was quite encouraged this week looking at some of the commentary around, obviously, the whole Scott Morrison saga. Um, for those of you that haven't been following, uh, Scott Morrison has basically uh, self-appointed himself to the minister, to be Minister of Health finance, home affairs, treasury, resource and industry throughout his time as a uh, prime minister. And he was basically a presidential sort of role. And um, a lot of people have really been <laughs> getting very upset about this because one man shouldn't have that many, that much <laughs> power. Um, in fact, uh, David uh, Astle uh, joked around saying that Scott Morrison's pronouns are they, them. Um, but w what's been encouraging out of all of this, guys, has been seeing the calls for a uh, actual, a bit more accountability. Now, the left is, a lot of the people in the, in the government right now, uh, like um, Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, he's been making the point that, you know, what was the Governor General doing? Maybe we should start moving towards a republic sort of model. Um, and, you know, he's basically going up after his political opponents. But then you get other people, like Chris Ullman, who was gracious enough to interview you, John, in, in Canberra, which made a huge impact, and you ended up, and he actually ended up making the point that no, this is actually we need we need to make room for a royal commission. This is all the more reason why government shouldn't have all this power. 
And I'll just play that clip for you guys uh, right now. No, it doesn't, Georgie. You could make an argument that the Prime Minister had to share the health portfolio in the pandemic because the biosecurity law is so draconian. It gives the health minister the powers of a dictator. It's bad law, but the solution shouldn't be bad government. If shadowing health was necessary, it should have been public. Everything after that was overreach, and Scott Morrison's own colleagues believe it undermined them. It's just one more example of why we must have a Royal Commission into the pandemic response that shines a bright light on every level of government, every leader and every bureaucrat. Anthony Albanese says it's inconceivable that there won't be a Royal Commission, Georgie. Well, the Prime Minister should call one now. Jens, what are your thoughts? I love the guy. I love him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I tell you, there's a tear in my eye after hearing that. I mean, because... Uh, Look, he has been, uh, without question, the one journalist in mainstream media that has been fair and balanced. Uh, not one side or the other, but fair and balanced. And, he, and he's reported it, um, uh, you know, in an accurate sense. Uh, he's given us an opportunity to talk. He's been very fair and reasonable. And what he asked for there was, was uh, well, it's a, it's a miracle, really, uh, that we're even talking about that. He, uh, he has really, really been a, uh, a beacon of light for uh, journalists in the mainstream uh, media. And, and uh, we don't need to thank him for doing his job, but, uh, you know, he, he, certainly, uh, he certainly has uh demonstrated that he is a very capable journalist and a very decent person Graham? well he he is to journalism what dr jay anthony is to medicine uh yesterday jay anthony mentioned terms that brought john and i to tears because she talked about things like first do no harm and informed consent and everything that came out of her mouth has been missing from the medical discourse for the last two and a half years and Chris Yulman is in that mould. And he and Rowan Dean, um, Sky News Rowan Dean, apparently is really hitting hard. And, you know, we're seeing um, we're seeing 2GB at odds with each other. Their presenters are, are fighting each other. Ben Fordham is fighting with that other clown. Um, uh, what's his face again? I keep forgetting yeah. his name. Um, hey, Radley. Yeah, yeah. Uh... So, look, I mean, this, this to me is a great sign. The fact that these doctors are now really speaking out in mass and in bulk, and we're st starting to see cracks in mainstream journalism. I mean, I featured on uh, Media Watch after the after the rally in Canberra. I don't know whether you saw that, Joel, but no, uh, you know that, that there was there was a distinct jibe against me in that from uh, its presenter. But he also highlighted some of the facts that I tried to get people to see that if you want mainstream media to talk about your story, you've got to stop spitting at them and calling them lies. You've got to actually uh, be be rational and reasonable. Otherwise, your message will not get across. And I think we're starting to see that. I think that's what worked with Chris when he, um, Chris Yulman came out behind the barricades at the new Parliament House and interviewed with John and I. And um, that's what Media Watch were talking about, about Chris's um, courage to come out and interview us and how we thanked him for doing that. I mean, it's inconceivable we've got to thank journalists for doing their job, but in this day and age, we actually do. Because if it weren't for guys like you, Joel, and, uh, and, and um, you know, all the other guys in, in the alternate media, uh, we wouldn't have any truth access whatsoever. Yeah, it's sort of the brilliance of big tech and, um, you know, I'm thankful for, to God that at the right times he provided the tools that we needed. I mean... You know, Graham, when you came out with your video about, um, and we're coming up a year, a year on that in, in September, when you came yeah. out with your video about, um, you know, blowing the whistle, I was watching the video again just, just recently, and you were saying, these people aren't just, you know, protesters trying to spread the, you know, the, 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 the virus everywhere. They're freedom fighters, and they're yeah. fighting for the right that you've given away. And I, I just think that, you know, it's so funny. And this is why I am really am a guy of faith. At every time when we've needed something and we ask for it, God just seems to provide it just like there. I mean, there have been protests, and I, I hate to get into the weather thing, but there have been protests where I've said to God, look, if you could just hold off the rain just for a couple of hours, 
And it's actually happened. It's been amazing. I am a guy of faith. I'm proud to say it. And I think that, you know, you can't explain the, the success we've seen the last two years without an element of the divine. But um, even, even with John Larda coming out and his story going gangbusters and people supporting him throughout his fight, you know, the fight's not over. But my God, has, has the support been over, absolutely overwhelming and encouraging to see? Yeah, it certainly has. Um, it's, it's been a roller coaster ride the last year, I think, for both of us, John. But uh, I've been up and down all over the place. And, you know, you find yourself in this situation where everyone says, oh, okay, he's going to be the spokesman for the entire freedom movement. So you get bombarded with everyone's different agendas and and uh, people get upset if you don't support the agenda they send you. And, and you literally cannot fight um, every single battle. You just have to fight them one at a time. And the last year, the roller coaster of the last year has been very much centred around that. And, you know, I think we get this Royal Commission happening. Call me naive. Some will call me naive. But this Royal Commission needs to happen because Morrison has put a spotlight on the mafia-style corruption in the Australian government. Let's make no bones about it. And that needs to be brought to the fore. And that covers everything in the realm of what's gone on in the last two years. Who knows what other scope that will throw forward? Mm -hmm. Look, yeah, we've lost faith in every institution uh, on earth. And royal commissions are no, uh, no different. But at least we're going to start to see some light shed somewhere. And that's a start that we've all been praying for for the last couple of years. All right. Well, well let's, let's try this. What are the conditions for success from a Royal Commission? What are the questions you want answered from a Royal Commission, gentlemen? John? Well, I think it needs to be far-reaching. Uh, I think it needs to be independent. And it really does need to uh, concentrate on the... The, whether whether there was a, a pandemic, uh, what uh, health um, outcomes were restricted uh, because of false information or uh, diabolical uh, mis, uh, misadventure, or um, you know pe people uh, uh, corruptly uh, uh, applying a set of values to something and ivermectin is a perfect example of of that people being denied health care uh that that could have prevented people from getting sick what what the health care system suffered as a result of the 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 the, the fraud uh that that's that's occurred uh so the pressure that that's put on the hospital system uh, from the, the closing down of back of house services to the dismissal of uh, frontline healthcare uh, workers, and ultimately the the, the corruption, uh, malfeasance uh, that's that's gone on behind the scenes in uh, perpetrating all this mess. Because you know we've now got a broken community as a result of a leadership uh, that was completely out of control, that was maniacal. Oh, I, don't, I don't know how else you describe it when you look at these premiers. I mean, that they were completely unhinged. That They've caused yeah. uh, that many deaths. They've caused that many injuries. They've caused uh, so much heartache uh, and disruption to the economy, to the social fabric of our community, to... Uh, people's well-being um, it, it's just so disproportionate um, to uh, to what we're what we're used to so I, I think it needs to be far-reaching it needs to be independent and I think that's going to be the difficult bit I mean what we don't want to have happen is uh, have a Royal Commission that gets bogged down for five years uh, with he he said she said uh, and <laughs> Have no no uh, accountability or, or or outcomes. You know, pe people need to be held to account for their actions, uh, um, and they need to be criminally charged if if there's uh, uh, evidence to suggest that they've done the wrong thing, and people need to be um, 
uh, compensated, uh, and, and there needs to be a, 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 a range of uh, issues or, or measures that uh, fix some of the uh, bad behaviour that's been experienced, and uh, that those measures need to be put in place with probably a long-lasting legacy for those that are injured. Lost your gel. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I don't know if you heard the news about uh, Victor Dominello, who's actually resigned from the New South Wales state government in the lower house. He is the architect of, I do believe, the Service New South Wales app, which they were using to put the jab passport in. Like, it just seems like all of the politicians that were the architects of this just have just jumped off the plague ship. And it's no worries. They're, you know, they've got their pensions. They're fine now. You know, they're happy, happy days forever. But these problems are, la are long-lasting. Inflation? I mean, are we going to pretend that we should never have locked down and induced this inflation due to the mass spending? I mean, I, there are very angry people right now, and they are looking for a direction to put their anger. Things, I don't think we're going to see a return to lockdowns, not for a very long time. And I don't think we're going to see a return to jab mandates as widespread as we saw in mid to late 2020. Um, 2021 rather but we're just starting to see and really feel that crunch of that cost of living crisis which they talked about during the election and they have no plans no plans to ease that cost of living it's only going to get worse employment's going to get worse and it just seems as though all of these politicians have just gotten off scot-free on their publicly paid uh pensions i mean this is this is i, I don't know you guys as angry as i am can I, can I give you a short, sharp uh, terms of reference for the Royal Commission? Sure. Number one, judicial deafness. Number two, propaganda mainstream media needs to be thoroughly investigated. APRA and its role need to be thoroughly investigated and they need to be disbanded. The role of state premiers to be able to close borders and trash the Australian Federal uh, Commonwealth Constitution needs to be examined and fully explained and the role of bureaucracy in destroying the lives of the Australian people it's meant to serve, that needs to be examined. Now, there's five or six in a hit, and I think we could add another five or six. But you deal with those things straight off the, off the bat, Joel. You're going to start solving some of the bigger issues that people are angry about. There are a lot of big questions that need to be answered, and the Royal Commission needs to start there. And once it starts dealing with those issues, then it needs to continue into all the other dark corners and crevices that, that are polluting the Australian psyche. Mm. Amen. I well, mean, and I, they, I totally agree. They shouldn't get their pensions, uh, uh, Joel. I mean, Ho Hoodie uh, summed that up beautifully, as he always does. Uh, <laughs> so it... it it's uh, it's not that difficult. I mean, people will make a mountain out of a molehill with the Royal Commission. They'll say, oh, you know. But look, it just needs to be kept very simple um, and and independent and just concentrate, as Hoodie said, on on, on some key things. And, and everything else will just come out in the wash. Um, that's the reality. We'll, we'll, we'll see things and then we'll, we'll be able to go down a diff different pathway when we see things happen. But the people uh, in these... Uh, positions of authority that are going to be collecting their pensions and thinking that they can exit stage left and get out uh, while the going's good. Uh-uh. You, you know, th th there is legislation that says uh, these politicians, uh, if they're found guilty of um, uh, criminal um, activity, then they give up their pensions. So... Oh. Yeah, it needs to go way beyond that too. They, they There needs to be jail time. Uh, yeah. There are people who are culpable and need to go to prison for long periods of time. Mm. That That's a must. That has to happen. And and we've also got to look at law enforcement, the way law enforcement's been used as a quasi-military, paramilitary organisation for the whims of these premiers. Um, man, th this... Uh, this And you watch, mark my words, there will be a Royal Commission or there'll be an independent inquiry and you watch the House of Cards collapse. Mm -hmm. They'll all be blaming each other. You know, the health bureaucrats will be blaming the premiers and they'll be blaming Atagi and all the others. But at the end of the day, this thing will fold in on itself as it must. It must for the sake of our nation. It must come down to that.
I, well, I'm so yeah. You go, John. Well, I was just going to say, Joel, but when when you go back to Morrison, now, I mean, it beggars belief to me what's going on there. I mean, people will, uh, <laughs> but you know, you you've got to go back to Gough, uh <laughs> yeah, before you, you see this same thing repeating itself. Now, Gough, Gough Whitlam, mm. he was sacked. He was sacked by the Governor General. Now, mm. what? here with Morrison, we've got a situation where, look, I can probably accept, I can probably accept Chris Yulman's uh, view of, of, of that. I think it's probably okay. Uh, the fact that uh, these laws were draconian, they probably did need a circuit breaker. Uh, the Prime Minister, uh, if, if everyone was aware that that was the case, fair enough. Uh, and I understand that he did tell Hunt and Hunt agreed. Well, fair enough. But why? I mean, the, the, the big question here is why did he then tippy-toe into all these other uh, ministries and not tell, not tell the people like uh, Matthias Corman that he was actually a, 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 a signatory or an authority to the ministry? I mean, no. I would have thought that was a massive thing. And he says yesterday or the day before on Ben Forder's program, oh, but Ben. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have to act and, you know, I didn't have to do anything. But look, the, the reality is here, he did. Yeah. And the one thing that he climbed all over was a decision that he, that he uh, made about a gas um, exploration uh, project or something off the New South Wales south coast. Yeah. Uh, now, why did he do that? He said that he had trust in his ministers to make the decision. But at the end of the day, <laughs> Because he overruled the bloke. That's right. That's right. He he, he did a long uh, post on uh, Facebook, big statement. Because just for context, guys, prime ministers, they typically, after they've served their term, even if they're still sitting members of parliament, they don't typically weigh in on politics, unless it's, of course, a guy like uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, who can't help himself, or uh, Kevin Rudd. Um, but when it comes to what he ended up saying, yeah, this this... He did wield this power. He did nuke a deal. He was trying to work, virtue signal to the Teals, to the Greens, to the to the lefty Labor people, and he ended up wielding that power against you know the interest of conservatives and right winged people, yep. and and he didn't even tell anyone he did it. I mean, yeah. when when you're in, and you know what, Labor did make one good point. They said when we're in Prime Minister's questions time and we're directing a question to a specific minister on a specific portfolio, we need to know who that minister is. And if you've got the prime minister running around here nuking gas deals, which are costing jobs of Australians, people deserve a right to have that scrutiny, no matter which party it's from. I mean, to an extent, this was a massive assault on democracy. Well, Joel, I, I think the other uh, thing to ask the question about here is, the one, if he was a he was a co-authority to the health portfolio. Now, the one thing that he should have injected himself into the back line for, in a football term sense, was he made out to the Australian community that mandatory vaccinations were not an Australian government endorsed uh, uh, thing. He he virtue signalled that from day dot. Now, the one thing that he should have injected himself into the back line for was that he should have come in and said to Hunt, no, I'm I'm the health minister as well. We will not be mandating and nobody will have the power to mandate uh, that in any workplace in Australia. But he, he did. He, he sat idle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, the... The idea that he was completely... He washed his hands of that is completely untrue. Former MP from the Liberal Party, uh, George Christensen, absolute legend. He came out and basically made the point that Greg Hunt, the Minister for Health, basically lied to them. He, he, that's what he said. And uh, George is not one to throw phrases around. He's very measured. They were told that the, the My Health record would not be used to actually put people out of their jobs. And they lied. They lied to the ministers that represent 100,000 people per electorate. George Christensen represents 100,000 people. And they, they lied to these ministers. So it was put in on a false premise. And this is the problem, guys. If the, if the government is given the power to do something, assume that they're going to do it. 
Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. They will use it. That's why you've got to be very careful. And that's why Chris Ullman is 100% right. The government way overstepped the mark here. And every now and then we do have to look at our constitution and be like, how can we make sure this doesn't happen again? We need to enshrine it. We need to have a referendum. We need to have a well-informed royal commission. And we need to make sure this doesn't happen again. Because this is the thing. A royal commission, a thorough one, done properly, it might take five years. But this is the thing, guys. There are kids that are 10 years younger than me, 20 years younger than me, that are in school, five to 18 years old. And we will know them as the COVID kids, the COVID babies, which aren't showing the same reactions to emotion as we are. So what could end up happening is these kids are going to grow up forever being stunted by the government decisions like lockdowns, keeping them away from peers, making, that, making sure that they're not so, as socialized as you or I was. And now we're in a situation where those have long lasting impacts. So if this is going to take, you know, two years, five years, 10 years to do this Royal Commission properly, it must be done because these kids, when they grow up, they're always going to blame these ministers and they're going to look to their parents and say, why didn't you stand up for me? Look, Morrison, Morrison's finished. I mean, if he's not finished, there's something even worse wrong with the system than we can imagine. Mm. What the Australian people are fed up with seeing is these corrupt politicians exiting stage left with their super and with all their entitlements intact, but then going on to do cushy jobs in the UN or, yeah. you know, they, they're working for the, the World Bank or the World Economic Forum. If these people keep popping up, we know the system is not going to be fixed and the Australian people won't tolerate that. They cannot be put through the meat mincer that they've been put through in the last few years and tolerate the guys who are on the grinder getting cushy jobs when they've had everything stripped away from them. They will not tolerate it. I won't tolerate it. Mm. Yeah, well said, Woody. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the other thing is too, Joel, there's nothing stopping the Royal Commission, Commission having uh, some interim findings. Uh, you know, if, if we investigate point one and, and it's obvious that there's problems, well, well, you know, present some interim findings uh, that are binding, um, you know, in lieu of the entire report being uh, done. We don't have to wait five years to get, you know, the answers to question one. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the questions I want answered is how did Australia stack up to other countries and other states? How did we stack up to Florida? That's a fairly comparable state in population. Did we need to lock down? Did we need to have mandates in schools? They didn't have mandates in schools. Kids were going to school. They didn't have to have mask mandates. In fact, the Florida governor went so far as to remove public funding for schools that put mask mandates for kids because it didn't make any sense. The kids weren't infecting each other. They weren't driving infections. They don't have a huge risk of dying due, due, to, due to COVID. And, and this, is, this is the frustrating thing. They're still going on with a lot of these things. You know, even during winter now, um, as things warm up for us in Australia, it's looking more and more idiotic, these measures, but overseas, it's going to start to get colder and they'll try and bring these, some of these things sort of back. Look, Brett Sutton, Brett Sutton, uh, uh, pretty much nailed himself to a tree, uh, the other day, uh, I think early August when he said, um, when he said that the vaccines, uh, you know, third and fourth shots weren't just, they just weren't working. Uh, having said that the only hope you've got for survival in April is to get the third and fourth shot. I mean, this is a clear indication. Now, these are these are out of his own, out of his, these are words from his own mouth. This is a clear indication that the, the health bureaucracy is either incredibly naive or it's incredibly corrupt. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an element of both there. And I think the Australian public is getting fed up with being told that they have to protect the health system, which is meant to be there to protect them. You know, I, I listened to a story last night of a, of a family in Canberra whose five-year-old daughter spent 12 hours in a hospital dying and nobody took her seriously. Now, uh, she died of myocarditis. Now, I'm not making any reference to vaccines here at all. I'm not talking about vaccines in this case at all. What I'm talking about is a health system that is completely and utterly crushed. That that should happen in the in Australia's capital city is an absolute disgrace. Mm -hmm. Now that is a measure of the of the corrupt ineptitude of governments in this country, of bureaucrats in this country. We're sick of electing 
members to the House and to the Senate who are who then have to have everything filtered through a bureaucracy that's out of control. And it's actually the tail that's wagging the dog. We're fed up with the bureaucrats running the country. We want our elected citizens to run the country. I'm into that. And, um, you know, I want to I want to commend you guys for building a safe space for people to come and have those discussions and listen to doctors and well-informed people, educated people in society. They're not crackpots. You're interviewing people that are respected in their fields. And for whatever reason, all the other professionals have just dropped the ball on this because of their own self-preservation. Uh, um, how do you fight back, guys? Well, you don't use Facebook. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's happened to your account, John? <laughs> well, I, I'm banned for seven days because I uh, I, I shared uh, Dr. Simone Gold's uh, tweet on the Icelandic uh, report. Now, it uh, contravened poor old Facebook community standards. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, well, John, where can we send people? I mean, obviously, they can see your content on, on Graham's uh, page, which I've popped up a few ta times. But um, are you on Telegram, John? Are you on Rumble? Yeah, look, I, I, I wouldn't have a clue where I am half the time. <laughs> I, 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 look, I think there's a uh, thing called Clo that uh, Michael Gray Griffiths has uh, introduced us to. I'm, I, my, my technical prowess with, the, with this is uh, very limited and, uh, and the kids... Uh, and the kids uh, try and help me, but they get frustrated. So um, I'm, not, I'm not as bad as Caitlin, but uh, I'm not not uh, fantastic at this stuff. So uh, yeah, there's a bit of Telegram, bit of BitChute, bit of whatever else. But uh, oh look, we. All <laughs> right. Get... Well, well, John, I'm going to um, make some inquiries into how to uh, build your following up again, and um, I'm very protective of the accounts I've helped build up and start off. Don't get me wrong. Graham's got an awesome team around him. He's got some excellent ladies who do, are very diligent with the uploading. But I get very upset when I see big tech attacking people that I like and I trust. And um, I want to make, I'm going to make sure that we keep your narrative going, um, not only on Graham's account, but even on Facebook, starting you up again and building that up again. They, they can't keep doing this. The people are still there. The people aren't going back to mainstream media. They're still looking for John Larder. They want to hear from John Larder. There are over 30,000 people that started following John Larder, and they're like, where is John? Why did he stop posting? He didn't. He didn't. Big tech is trying to be an idiotic parent for you. They reckon you're all stupid, and they're trying to censor John Larder because they don't think that this paramedic is qualified to talk on these topics. Well, you know what? This is why I do what I do. This is why I try to help... You know, get the, raise the voices of these excellent men who have expertise in their areas. You know, I'm just a construction guy. But John Larder, he's an, he was a respected paramedic. He is a respected paramedic. And he is someone that has been speaking out. He put it all on the line. And what is the thanks that his government gives him? They come after him in every kind of way that is absolutely despicable. <laughs> John, I, hope, I do hope you run again because I can't wait to, you, to see you uh, f throwing facts and logic at some of these uh, knuckleheads in Parliament. Oh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't mean to poke the bear here, but I'm, I'm still wondering why I've never even been put into Facebook jail. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand it. I, I mean, here I go. I'm gone now for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But look, to be honest with you, it, it almost embarrasses me. I think I've got 135,000 followers or something, and I think you were warning me nearly six months ago that my following is getting too big and I'm likely to get hammered by them. But I, I don't know why, other than divine intervention, that I'm still going. I know it's not as effective because I'm shadow banned and whatever those terms mean. But I'm like, John, I've got zero. I mean, if, if uh, Facebook was an aeroplane, I would have crashed it a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, I've got no idea how to fly that sucker. Uh, uh, I've, I've got a few theories, but I won't say it on live here because then they'll, they'll go after you. But um, yeah, look, when, once you cross the 100K mark, um, uh, Graham, I, I was starting to get a bit worried because um, there are a number of accounts I've helped build to 100K. And once they get to that point, there's something that happens, and they do tend to come heavily censor you. But um, but well, I have you're my the common denominator. No, yeah. well, no, you're still around. You you are still around, and you know we've learned from our experiences in the past. And um, I, I'm glad that uh, there's. I reckon the man upstairs is also keeping a watchful eye over you. And um, and you don't just talk about this specific stuff. You talk about 
actual like Christian living, Australian living, the Anzac spirit. And a lot of that stuff, it's like the fact checkers look through it and they're like, we can't really ban that. I mean, it's not really, you know, bannable. Um, but, um, but look, I have no doubt that um, this uh, censorship is, uh, game is not over. And um, I do want to just leave you guys with some encouraging uh, news. So I don't know how, if you guys listening know how this works. When John and Graham and I want to talk and do a stream on something, we literally, within 30 minutes, we're, we're on the camera and we're talking with each other. So while I was out, I was getting an acai bowl out down the road and I ran into this guy called uh, Gene. Gene runs a group that started off with three people. Now talking about jab injuries and everything, it's now grown to over 20 times that. It's at 65 people and that is the model for success. That is what's going on on a massive level. You know, people like Graham and John, they've been making the point that we need to be building our own self-sustainable communities and coming together and building culture and looking out for each other. Well, that's what this group's doing. Now, I'm, I'm seeing them on Sunday. I can't wait to, you know, hear from them and hear their stories and hear what's going on and hear how they've been bonding. But that's success. That's what we've got to get back to. And um, I want to you know, give full credit to, to Graham and, and John for encouraging people like this who are fans of your work. Yeah, uh, Joel, I want, to, I want to say something that was said to us yesterday. I think it's the quote of the entire last two years. And it came from Jayanthi uh, Kunadasan, Dr. Jayanthi Kunadasan, that wonderful lady. Uh, you're going to love her presentation when you get to see it. But um, she said that talking about the medical profession, it's been broken by people who didn't build it. And I can say that about Qantas. Qantas has been is a 100-year brand that has been broken by people who didn't build it. And when you think about what what insect out there destroys things that other th other other things build and other people build, it's a termite. Yeah. And this country wants to needs to do termite eradication. Mm. Uh, this country is being destroyed by people who had nothing to do with building it. We're talking Absolutely. about the corporations from overseas. We're talking about all the other corporate fingers that are in the pie and everything that we do and say in Australia. We're talking about uh, new world orders and, and world governments and one world religions and all this Babylonian garbage. Our, our fibre, every fibre of our being is being chewed away by termites and they didn't build it. And that's what makes the whole Anzac thing so heartbreaking. Mm. Because they went to build our freedom and it's been eroded by termites and people who let termites eat away without getting an inspection done, without getting someone to come into their house and tap on the floorboards and without then getting the pesticide in there to, to rid the place of the termites. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you eradicate them. What, what you do is with a termite is you find a way of getting a poison to the bee, no, sorry, to the queen, in the termite colony, and that's the end of it. It stops. We've got to find out who's running this show and and put them where they need to be, in prison. Absolutely. Um, we need to clear out of all levels. And speaking of clear outs, and I'm conscious of time, I've got to get uh, let John and Graham get on to interviewing another excellent doctor in their field, expert in their field. But, um, but yeah, so in, in Victoria, they're, they're priming up for... Uh, their election. They've got 101 days before their state election uh, to get rid of Daniel Andrews. And um, I'm very much looking forward to um, assisting wherever I can with that. Dan has been absolutely trashing every institution down there. IBAC is a to toothless tiger. I don't know how many times he's dodged IBAC, dodged the media. You know, um, his, his worm tongue is, is, is phenomenal, his ability to get out of things. Um, just so you guys know, I'm heading down to Victoria to support Topher Field's documentary on uh, Battleground Melbourne about how this actually happened and how he gave himself these emergency powers. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Topher and uh, supporting him on that on the 23rd. And um, when it comes to, you know, what's going on in this country, I think we do need to keep meeting up in groups. I think that it's, it's, it's vitally important. And I, I, you know, Gene, big shout out to you that I saw you at the cafe today. You're a legend. I'm sorry that the, the things that have happened to you and your family um, over the course of the last few years. And um, this is part of the reason why we meet and why we strengthen each other and why we, it's basically church of a different way. It's camaraderie. It's, it's, it's a brotherhood. And um, I, I want to um, encourage people, um, if you're in Sydney, um, don't forget that we've actually got this Nigel Farage tour as well on 
uh, on month on um, I do believe it's Tuesday the twenty seventh of September. Graham and John are going to be there. Um, we've also got an interview with Nigel Farage coming up online, so you guys will get a bit of a taste about what that's going to be like. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, to doing that with you, you absolute legends. And um, if you guys want tickets for that, you can book now at Nigel Live. Uh, domcombat.au but gents I'm going to let you go if you're listening live right now please follow Graham Hood uh, it's not Graham Hood it's Pilot Graham Hood Motivational Speaker Ma- Graham Hood Motivational Speaker and you've also you got jo- I should but I didn't change it I set it up as Graham Hood so uh, someone's changed it but um, then you've also got John Larder on Facebook there being heavily censored. I'm going to look into that. I'm going to make sure that he continues to, um, you know, John, we're going to start collecting emails because I'm sick of these bastards basically going after you. And I don't know if you've got an email database too, Graham, but we need some backups. You know, we, we can't keep playing whack-a-mole with, um, with these people that, that basically want to, want to, they want to censor us for life. So I'm going to make some uh, inroads into that because uh, we can't have two of our strongest voices in New South Wales, especially ahead of upcoming elections, being censored. So, gents, any final um, words for our audience? Oh, that, that, uh, that Victorian poster was amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can put yeah, it back up if you want. It all. Um, that that poster says it speaks volumes. You've got look at Morrison on the left hand side laughing. Yeah. Um, you know you've got you've got police commissioners raising their hands and and uh, look that says it all. It's just incredible. And there's Chairman Dan. Mm. Good grief! I mean that's that's what's wrong with Australia right there on one poster. Oh, you man. couldn't make that stuff up, John. Couldn't make it up. I think. Oh. That's- you just couldn't make this stuff up. God bless you, gentlemen. The 26th of November, 101 days away. Victorians, we're here to help. And uh, we're going to see what result we can get together. I'll see you guys Thank later. Amen. Amen. God bless you, gentlemen, and keep up the great work. Thanks, Joe. Good night, mate.